Hi everybody, welcome back. This is uh, instructor Phil Dimitriotis. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about part two um, for the basic drawing for entertainment arts class. We're going to be talking about the human form and what are some of the differences in what we're going to be doing and why we're moving into um, studying proportions and drawing the wooden mannequin. So just as a reminder, I always like to do this in the beginning. Excuse me for a second. I just want to remind you what part of our last lecture was when we were discussing and talking about um, how other fine artists work and part of the difference is is they go in a lot of times and spend a tremendous amount of time on the human figure where you get into a rendering and a paint mode and that's something that we're not necessarily going to be doing. Part of our goal is to work more from a form, a structure, observation, acting, understanding, silhouette, shape, gesture, and then moving over towards embellishment and then that you know takes us up towards doing model sheets for character posing and body. So don't worry, you don't have to write all that down. I'm going to cover it in this lecture. And I was trying to think of a way to help explain that to you as artists, is how do we go the difference between the sort of fine art side of working, and then how do we also at the same time dive into, you know, this, this other version of drawing, which is us looking at, you know, still life studies and, um, and drawing people in motion and in action and just trying to capture personality and mode, okay? So let's go back to the lecture then. That's a little bit of review there. One of the things I wanted to talk about in the very beginning here was that a friend of mine, his name's Joe Spatterford, and we had actually a pretty cool conversation the other day. Um, I helped train him back in the day when we were working at, at Big Idea together, and um, he's now working over at Christian Broadcast Network in, I believe it's North Virginia, and he's um, in charge of, he's like their key art director in charge of a lot of their their projects, a lot of their animation projects. I think he, other does, he also does some things with marketing and branding and other items. But um, one of the conversations, we get together, you know, we talk on the phone long distance and we happen to be talking about, you know, we always have these conversations like what if. So when I was talking with Joe and we were going through uh, part of the basics of, of where we ended up as artists, we have this what if conversation and our what if conversation continued into what if I had spent more time in the figure? What if I mastered the figure a little bit better? Joe had made a comment and said, instead of being in an art director role, I might have got into a storyboarding role, which would have led me into being a director. OK, and there's a direct tie to that. So you guys are newbies here and you're learning how to draw the figure and we're approaching it a little bit different than the other artists in the fine art program tend to do, okay? And I'm gonna cover that in just a minute here. So when I spoke with Joe, the one thing he says is, Phil, you got it, you gotta have your students. You have to tell them they have to learn the figure. They have to be able to draw out of their imagination from multiple point of views and quickly. And if they can do that, it's gonna make them better draftsmanship. And the thing about drawing the figure is the figure is already complicated enough that if you learn to master it in its sort of simplistic form, it allows you then to be able to draw other things, okay? And because if you can draw the figure very well, you can draw it out of your imagination at multiple points of view, and you can do it quickly, drawing a car, drawing props, drawing vehicles, all those other things become secondary to the figure, okay? The figure is sort of like a life pursuit. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of history that ties behind part of the figure. And I'm not an art historian, but I wanted to quickly go over that with you guys and to show you how sort of this relates and how it's been sort of transcended through part of our culture, especially to what we do, okay? So the end part of my conversation with Joe, the end conclusion was your students need to be in their sketchbook. They need to be drawn, drawing all the time. In fact, when I tend to look at portfolios now, one of the first things I ask for is anybody can do a finished drawing that has four or five hours of tonal work in it, where they've looked at a model. A lot of times you've even taken picture of a model with your phone, right? However, what he said is, which is true, which is, you know, I've shown this to you guys before. Here's my sketchbook, okay? What are you doing in your sketchbook in terms of drawing the figure? Are you drawing people? Are you drawing creatures? Are you going to drawing events like the easel event on Fridays, right? What are you doing to make yourself better? So whenever he gets somebody that comes in for a role of a design position, the first thing Joe does is they usually in their portfolio never put this. They never put the sketchbook. And the first thing he does is he asks them, can you send me samples of your sketchbook via PDF or can you drop it off here to the studio so you can take a look at it? And the reason why he does that 
is because he wants to see your ability to sketch something quickly and to be able to transfer it quickly. He doesn't want to see your ability to copy something in five or six hours. And that's what I was telling you guys. That's the difference between the fine art method of drawing and rendering and painting and between our method of drawing quickly. Okay. Another side story to that. Mr. Miller, who was an old instructor here in art, okay, his son went out and, you know, studied from his dad, went to art school, had an interview with Activision at one of the E3 gaming events as a con for concept artists, right? He had a portfolio with tons of beautiful work inside it, okay? He displayed that por portfolio to Activision. They loved it. You know what their comment was? Two of their art directors said the same thing. We loved all the finished and polished work. Bring us your sketchbooks. Luckily, his dad was an artist and brought him up on drawing. He went home, came back to E3 the next day, had five sketchbooks in hand, threw them on the table. They opened them, looked for maybe two minutes, and said, you're hired. And he walked out. Okay, so what does that mean? That means your ability to get out there and draw is actually more important than the final outcome. But the hard thing with you, for you guys as students, like that book that Robert has, we were just looking at it at the beginning of class, right? That's a book from Art Center grads on all the finished, polished work. You see the difference is you guys are looking at the finished, polished work, and you see that is what you're trying to obtain to. That's partially correct. However, part of it comes back to your sketching and your ability to draw on a regular basis at an expedited level inside your schedule. Okay. All right. So this is really annoying me that I can't get this to go into lecture form. What is the history of the human fork? Okay. Uh, I'm sure Jaime Perez would probably... Hit me in the head with a club because I'm going to go over it in about two minutes here, right? Because there's so much to learn from an art history class. But, okay, we, as culture, as human beings on this planet, we first started to represent the human form in terms of fertility, okay? Tribes of people would create little sculptures of the human form, and they usually showed women and men in terms of fertility basis, understanding who the fertile woman was inside a, a tribe and who was the man and how did the population grow. Your population was everything back then. So if you look through, you'll find in all different cultures from around the world, these little teeny sculptures, okay? Eventually, it jumped forward from that and the Egyptians had the next role, which was displaying the human form. But the problem is, is that they displayed it in total symmetry, okay? It, they had people locked up Okay, we talk about this thing in, in figure drawing called contrapasta. It's the angle of the shoulders in relationship to the hips, creating movement and flow inside part of the body, right? The Egyptians kept, if you look at the lines, okay, they kept their lines straight. So if you look at the shoulders and the hip lines, the people barely moved. The arms were locked down at the side. One foot was stepped forward. Everything was extremely tight. What does tightness represent? What does this pose look like? Artificial, but it's also following orders. And if you see someone in the military like this, right? It's that tightness. It's part of that pose that carries through. The Egyptian culture was based off of rulers and kings. All of their architecture is based off of symmetry. Everything in their culture is based off of symmetry. So when they were showing their kings and queens, they were showing them ruled out with complete lines, very stiff and very symmetrical, right? They did that continuously. They did that, and then the Greeks were even influenced. This is a Greek sculpture, sculpture over on the right-hand side here, okay? The Greeks started doing the same thing. However, something changed, and obviously me being Greek, being Greek, having Greek culture and going to Greece almost every summer when I was a kid, okay? There was a difference here, and this is the difference in thinking that changed the way that we viewed the human figure. The Greeks have more to do with how the human figure was interpreted. And not only that, but in Western culture, they revolutionized the way that we view women, okay? Women were not viewing as equals back in this time period, okay? Men were the leads, okay? But the Greeks figured out a way to change that a little bit. And this is what happened. In Greek culture, there were two things, three things that were really created. The two main things were ethos and pathos, okay? Part of that that gets forgot is logos, which has to do with logic, okay? Ethos and pathos transitioned into the way they ran their culture. It transitioned into the way that they developed art. It transitioned in their storytelling and everything that they did as a society, okay? So what was ethos and pathos? Ethos, okay, that's your, you know, your reputation as an individual. It reflects style. It reflects the credibility of a nation, okay? Pathos, um, to me, that's the part which you guys know that 
you've heard that word before used inside, you know, American English, okay? Um, being of emotional or imaginative impact, okay? The ability to tell stories. Why would that be important? Because now you have a culture that had a background of gods, okay? So they had to display their gods. They believed in the gods. They didn't necessarily, you might have a ruler of, of one, you know, might have a king, but you had gods that everybody prayed to. And it wasn't just one god. There were numerous gods. And what changed is you went from this straight version of a figure, and then you jump down into this. You jump down into mythological stories of, of these super beings and what they would do in terms of their cultural background, right? So when you get down into this, you started to see a change. You started to see, and, and sorry, some of these slides were, let me see if I can get that guy framed up there a little bit. I was hoping this would go into full view, but I think I need to reinstall PowerPoint. So you start to see Athena, you see Aphrodite, you start to see Perseus, you start to see these stories where the human form is now turning. Look at the look at the break of symmetry in here. The symmetry is gone. Okay. The human figure is now gone into a total change. This is the only culture that had done this up until this time. Nobody had represented the human form in this way. Okay. So part of the human figure and the history of it comes back into a storytelling aspect. To me, that's important because that conversation I'm having with Joe Spadford over this last weekend, while we're sipping our little cup of whiskey, is talking about where we could have been in terms of storytellers if we had more knowledge and got knowledge at a quicker pace as, um, as young artists. And, and if we spent more time on the human figure, remember, if you're really good at drawing the human figure, you can become a director in the long run because you're dealing with staging and setting up sequences, okay? But do you see the difference here? Can you imagine looking at this type of sculpture? And, and the other thing that was really cool about the Greeks is they were displaying women in power, okay? Women were equals. They were at God levels, okay? You have Aphrodite. You have Athena. What was Athena, folks? Huh? Okay, wisdom, right? Okay, and my Greek mythology is off because it's not something I follow all the time. But when you go back and you start looking at part of this, this is a great, this is, I'm proud to say from part of my background, this is Nike of Samothrace, okay? Unfortunately, the original is in the Louvre. It was stolen by English and it was placed inside part of the Louvre, but part of the original um, copy that they have is back in, in Northern Greece. Okay, in a territory called Thessaloniki, and up in the north part of Greece, this sculpture was done representing Nike. Okay, and look at the difference in the human figure. Look at the change. I mean, it's hard to see. There's tons of pictures that you can see online, but um, look at first of all, look at the height. Look at how it's elevated. In a lot of my design classes, we talk about elevating things in higher elevations to achieve the role of power. Okay, but this, look at the beauty and the gesture and the curve in that human figure. Okay, look at the, the, the torso wrapped with cloth, okay, displaying the beauty. And then here's this individual with wings of a god having this power, right? Now the head and the arms are gone because unfortunately they were broken off and they were stolen. And, and if you ever go back to Greece or you're in parts of France and you're at Museum d'Orsay or the Louvre, you'll notice that you'll see like the this is really annoying to the Greek culture. The head of Perseus is inside Museum d'Orsay, but the body is inside is back in Greece, because back in you know the 1800s you had travelers that were coming around and they would sneak in, they would break off and steal, and then sell these elements to the uh, to other countries that would place inside museums. They'd get a lot of money for it, and the English museum still to this day refuses to return it back to Greece. Okay. In fact, if you're in Greece, a little side note, okay, there are lots of areas that you can scuba dive and go snorkel, and the Greek government lets all the ruins stay down there. They don't pick them up. They have old vases. They have old sculptures. When I go to northern Greece, there's a city up there called Philippi, okay? The city of Philip, where King Philip raised Alexander the Great, okay? That's why I'm Philip and my son's named Alexander. It's from that same territory, okay? Okay. Um, you can walk around there and pick up pieces of marble that have been carved in. The Greek government allows it to be out there because they want to encourage tourism, but they don't want you to steal it. And that's been one of the problems that's affected part of this, okay? Um, so you, you have a historical significance of armies and war 
okay? And you basically have storytelling individuals that are in a culture that is evolving around ethos and pathos that have to display to the next group of generations coming by what are the stories that are happening. And how do they do that with mythology? How do you do that with history of invasions, of wars, of King Philip, Alexander the Great? You do that through art and sculpture, okay? And that is their version of storytelling, okay? But along with that, here's probably my some of my, my two favorite ones that I love to show right here, is here is the evolution of the human form, okay? And the Greeks doing more than any other culture up to this time to display the beauty of the female figure, okay? They wanted to indicate its power, and they wanted to be able to show it in multiple poses, okay? That right there is a key figure that changed and identified part of Western culture, and if you look at part of the news today and you go back and you look through cultural backgrounds, okay, this was huge. What the Greeks did is they gave a sense of equality for the human form and the human figure, okay? When I was younger, I traveled to Morocco, okay? When I went to Morocco, I was there for 30 days with my backpack, backpacking around the country, okay? There was a change of thought there because when you went down into other cultures and based religions, the human form and, fe excuse me, the female form is not allowed to be shown in cultures. It is covered, okay? It's a different mentality that goes by a different belief system, okay? All open belief systems across the world, but here is a changing moment that, that define part of Western thought and culture, and this still continues today. One of the other things that I was talking to, I had an old instructor here, and I remember doing a report, and they talked about um, female sculptures that went from Greek period into Roman period, and they used to fatten up the lips a little bit. Why would they fatten up the lips a little bit on a sculpture in human form? Does it sound familiar to something that women do today? They inject chemicals into their lower lip to make them look a little bit more inflated. You know what that's from? Because when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, and somebody is attracted, your lips fill with blood when you're kissing them, okay? And it's a sign that's communicated through or communicated back in this time period, and it's still something that comes through today, okay? So where does that lead us, okay? I want you to understand some of the basics here and how the history of this human form and how it arrived and where we came from. So I know it's a jump, but we go from this level of beauty and understanding the representation of the human figure, and I know, and we jump to the wooden mannequin, okay? And I, I know it's a little bit of a leap, right? But there's a principle there, and this is where I wanted to go over sort of those principles. By the way, I, side note, I was looking up, you know, there's like four different ways to spell mannequin. So there's an English way, an uh, old English way, an American way, and then there's like a French way. So I stuck with part of the French wave right now, but this is what you guys are working on. You guys are posing this individual that you have on your desk at multiple poses. Why? Because you want to be able to get to a point where you can see this particular individual, your wooden mannequin, doesn't have any thought or feeling, but you want to be able to pose him where you're giving him thought and feeling, okay? Him or her, whichever one. Didn't, Robert, you bought the female mannequin, right? So whatever you want to call your mannequin, right? Our ability is to pose that mannequin and to be able to get a feeling of gesture inside, okay? So at an honest level, there are multiple things that you are learning right now as young artists. Right now, you are learning proportion and you are learning gesture, okay? And I'll get to the other steps here in just a minute. You have to learn how to pose your mannequin and how to have your mannequin moving and guiding through the air and going into different poses that communicate something to us. In that section of posing, you are also showing us proportions, okay? You have to learn this, okay? It's extremely, extremely important. If you go to figure drawing and you go to painting, and I would, I had this conversation with Jim Daddles, who's head of our illustration department here and teaches figure drawing courses, all right? One of the biggest problems with artists that go into the fine art method of spending four to eight hours on a painting is they spent four or eight hours just rendering and painting, but the proportions are still off. So if the proportions are off and the perspective is off, remember I did a little demo for you? I'm going to do another, another lecture on Monday where I'm going to draw the human figure in perspective on grids. We talked a little bit about that when I showed you some of Brian Murray's storyboard work about having to draw 
people in motion and acting in relationship to a horizon line, right? Well, that's another problem, okay? I, I have some of you that come from drawing backgrounds where no one taught you anything about a horizon line. And we've been talking about this in this class from day one, because when we start on simple shapes, I had mentioned to you that everything that you were looking at exists with a dedicated horizon line. Same thing when you're drawing the figure. So when we go to downtown Disney next week, the person that you're going to look at that might be going up to get a drink or that's going into a shop to a cashier, the first thing you need to ask them is what is their relationship to me as I'm drawing them, as I'm looking at them, where's my horizon line? So if I'm looking at you right now and I'm drawing you, where's my horizon line? It's up here in my eyes. I'm looking down on every one of you. But if I'm at downtown Disney with my sketchbook and I'm sitting like this, now where's my horizon line? If I'm looking at Kai right here. My horizon line's right here. It's my eye level. Okay? It, I'm looking at Kai, so I can see under Kai's chin right here when I'm drawing. That's where it all changes, and that's one of the differences that you have to learn with your mannequin. Some of you guys already started sketching with your mannequin, and I walked around, and the first thing I noticed on a lot of your papers is there's no line representing the horizon line. And I covered that. It's on our blog. That was step number one. Place the horizon line in. Then we start with the head ball, then we go to the, to the line of action, then we fill in the shapes, right? So the importance of this is as you start posing and looking and mastering the proportions of your mannequin, what will happen over time is, you know, you're going to transition this into general thought and posing with gesture in it, okay? And eventually you're going to get to a point where you can start. The goal is, is for you to be able to draw that mannequin where you've spent so much time drawing him that you can draw him out of your head when there's nobody around. So if I ask you to say, hey, Connor, I need you to draw two knights about to fight three knights. How would you stage that? You can't run out and grab your three of your friends and put them in a knight outfit and set up a camera and take a picture. You can't do that. You don't have the time to do that. You have to be able to figure it out. So you have to be able to construct it from a drawing point of view. That's where we throw the horizon line in there. And the thing is, remember I showed you in Brian's work how messy some of the boards are? We don't care about the detail. What we care about are the gestures and the posing to make sure those are on. Okay? This is your pathway right here. This is, I looked this up and I found this and I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's already, they're going over what we're talking about. See this? This is your mannequin right here. This is the method in all of drawing the human form. Okay, it's understanding that you have basic proportions and that these proportions come together and they originate to form one entire form with a gesture. All right. All this stuff is later. This is more the fine art side where we get into the detail, the rendering, and then we start getting the muscles to to show. And, and we talk about highlights and core shadows. That's a little bit later. Part of that isn't as important to me right now. What's important to me is this. And then I found this. This is for a 3D Maya. And I'm like, oh, my God, look at that. Here's where you guys have the opportunity to start changing part of your mannequin. Yes, you can squash and stretch your mannequin. Your mannequin right now looks like a 5'11", 170-pound individual. But that's not the shape that all of us exist as people, right? There are people of all different sizes and backgrounds. So when I this is actually a rigging pack that's sold for 3D where you can buy these various characters and you can animate them. Why is that important? Because part of our next step out of proportion, which I'm going to show you in a second here, is understanding shape and silhouette that leads us to gesture. Okay, so how is Tina going to walk right here versus how is this big guy right here, we'll call him Greg, how is Greg going to walk versus Tina? They're going to walk in different structures because they have different body sizes, they have different body proportions, and they have different adjustment of weight. Look at Fred. Fred is my dad right there, okay? My dad's 84. He's hunching over, okay? He walks very slow. He uses a cane. So Fred's gestures are going to be totally different than Jill's gestures. Do you guys see that? So as you're sketching people at Disney next Wednesday, I want you to think about how do I take the proportions of my mannequin and get them to fit to the individual that I am observing? That is going to be really important, very key. So this is where we move into shape. This is where we start thinking about what are the shape basics of different people and different individuals. Okay? So shape is key because you have people that are going to be tall and thin. You're going to have people that are going to be wide and short. You're going to have somebody who's wearing a long jacket. 
you know, that might look like a square. You might have a bodybuilder type guy that has like a huge upper torso and skinny little legs. Okay, so as you're drawing, this is where you have to make that transition cognitively as an artist, where you're looking at the proportions of the mannequin you've been sketching, but now you're having to go and transition that to the individual that you are observing and looking at. And that's where it starts to change. That's why, you know what, when I'm done later today, I'm going to go back up and I'm going to put this on the blog for you, because I think this is just a great reference. To me, that is the wooden mannequin that's been changed over and over and allows you to see the variance there, okay, in the human form. Okay, so here we go into shape, right? Look at this sketch right here. That's beautiful. That was from somebody's sketchbook I found on Pinterest, right? That's somebody just going out. Look at the different shapes of the different people they are seeing. Are they doing any interior details? No. Is there any indication of eyes? No, there's not. There's this basic shape of people because people have all different types of body shapes. So when you guys are out sketching, you need to start thinking about this. What are the shapes that I am seeing and how do I relate those forms to my sketching and my sketchbook? Okay. The next, so I was thinking about this. What are the different variations as we move through? That's why I'm labeling all these. I'll put these up on the blog, right? What happens after shape? Part of your relationship to shape that happens at the same time, okay, goes into silhouette. This is what we talk about all the time in the character design class, the silhouette. The first thing that we see, I have a dedicated lecture just on silhouettes and shapes, okay? It's about 45 minutes to an hour. It's already on our YouTube site, okay? The first thing that we look at when, as human beings, the first thing that we see is silhouette shape. We're trained that way from babies, okay? We, we, we first understand simple shapes, then we understand more complex shapes. So simple shapes are like what? We say ball, all right? We see maybe like a triangle, a plate, round, basic, core, primitive shapes, right? The next thing as kids, and me being a dad having two kids, I watch this happen as they grow up. Then what's, an, what's a more complicated shape that a kid's going to see? Dog. They point and they see it, and they don't know what kind of dog it is, but they know it's dog. Or they see a leaf, and they'll be like, tree, leaf, and they get that. They see different types of trees. Their visual Rolodex inside their brain is operating at a new level. Every time you take a baby out anywhere, they're looking around them and they're picking up all this visual information of all this scenery and they're bringing it inside their brain, okay? So what's the advantage for us is when we get into silhouette shapes, it allows us to start transitioning into basics of design, right? Because when we're taking the human form and we're looking at this, for example, I could say to you, you know, Where's a single mountain bike rider? And you could be like, that shape or that shape. Okay. So now by looking, where's the shape where somebody's walking, you know, who just came from Starbucks? You can look at this individual walking with a coffee in their hand, right? So what happens is our shapes start to tell stories. That's one of the keys right there. Is your shapes of a particular individual give me a story and have a visual impact of who that individual is, their gesture and what they're doing, okay? Along with that shape, we can transition that shape this is where we get into product design, where we get into prop sketching, okay? Because we're transitioning shape, and it allows us to get a better feel for what is the emotional impact of the particular item. So here's my favorite example of emotional, what, I'm going to show you this in a minute, but here's another example of shapes with trees. Shapes just aren't human beings. They're also trees and environments, right? Okay, that are communicated as well. But this is what happens when shape has emotional connection and communicate something to us, okay? The Incredibles, all right? When Brad Bird worked on this movie, it was really important to him that you could establish the visual silhouettes of every one of the characters and know who they are before they even talked, acted, or did anything in terms of gesture. Does that make sense? So if you look over here and you look down here, you can tell who Mr. Incredible is, right? Look at his body, okay? He has a very definitive... There we go. You can see the whole slide. He has a very definitive shape. His silhouette is totally different than that of his wife. Okay. His daughter, who is supposed to be like a 13 or 14 year old teenager, smart out, punched forward, unsure of herself, going through a period where she's, you know, trying to figure out her identity as an individual, as a young teen. Okay. How about the son? Do you remember him? Cocky, getting in trouble, doing things he's not supposed to do. Okay. All of this gesture and form is represented inside their silhouette study. 
So this is something that we talk about when I get to character design because I tell my students before you even get to any form of detail, your silhouette better communicate to me what the assignment is. So if my assignment is that you're supposed to draw an angry turtle, I should be able to look at the silhouette shape of the turtle without any detail and be able to identify what it is. If you do that, you've now become a successful designer. And here's the difference, in my opinion, between us and entertainment arts and other artists, is we become designers. We have to start thinking about the emotional impact and what is the narrative of the story, okay? So if I go back to the Greeks, okay, if I go back to Mesopotamia, what is the purpose of telling a particular story for that culture? The difference is, is that we have evolved the storytellers. Now, instead of doing sculptures out of marble, we're doing sculptures out of clay, but then we're telling stories inside a movie. That's the only thing that's different is that technology's changed, okay? We don't have to carve and sit around and look at a bunch of sculptures in marble to have an idea of what that story is, right? We can look at these characters and get an idea of what their visual impact is, okay? Based off of their shapes and their silhouettes. Next, as you guys continue to draw, and you're, so when you're out drawing, look at someone's silhouette, look at their shape. There's nothing wrong in your sketchbook with filling a whole bunch of silhouettes of people. If you can't get to the detail, or you're struggling in your proportions, look at what's in my sketchbook right here. It's all silhouette studies in the lower portion. It's the first thing I go out and do. If I'm at a coffee shop at Starbucks and people are moving too fast, I might not be able to get all their detail, but what I can do is I can get their gesture and their silhouette and shape on to my sketchbook, all right? So that next progression, right, is you will start to notice this. As your proportions are getting better, you're going to start to move towards a sense of gesture, okay? Gesture is pivotal because gesture displays human movement and it communicates human personality, okay? And it gets to one of our next topics that we're coming up to. It has to deal with acting, okay? It has to deal with a performance skill, okay? So now if you look at some of these, I thought these were nice because these sketches here, to me, when I look at them, they're very consistent, they're very proportional, and you see the relationship to those being to your wooden mannequin that you all have on your desk, right? They're almost identical to the mannequin. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that, right? Okay. However, though, what happens when you don't have, one of the things we do in the figure drawing class we have on Fridays is we do 30-second poses. In 30 seconds, you might not have the ability to draw the mannequin, right? But what you can do is you can draw a couple of lines, like I showed you in the last class. I started with the head ball. I started with the line of action, all right? And then I talked about, we'll start talking about the visual weight of the leg and the arms, the key gesture of what the individual is doing, right? You have the ability to start communicating that through, okay? What happens, though, is that over time, we don't want you to sit down and spend five or ten minutes per each drawing in your sketchbook. Eventually, you have to bypass that. You have to be able to look at a human figure in the human form and be able to sketch it in a series of minutes very quickly. This is the benefit of going out and drawing out inside observation, being outside. Okay. So, of course, I'm, that's our next category is, is observation and acting. Okay. But before we get there, I just wanted to show you a couple other variants. Okay. When you start to perfect gesture, your drawings come alive and they start to get a feeling of, of, of empathy to them. You can create <coughs> happiness and sadness. You start to create personalities that come out of the character. This right here is the hardest level for students to overcome. It doesn't matter at a community college level, at a Cal State level, or university level. Everybody gets to about the, about the proportion level. And then the difference is the time and the drawing mileage spent that gets you to this upper level right here. When you can pose the human figure in multiple variations with heavy gesture indicating something is going to happen, okay? Look at this right here. Look at the dad running after his daughter like he's a big plane, having fun. That's really difficult to do. If I ask you guys to do that right now, if I turn off this projector, plot a piece of paper, draw a horizon line, put a grid on it, draw a dad running after his daughter doing an airplane. That would be really difficult to do. But if you've posed your mannequin enough and you have enough drawing mileage there, you could do that easily by drawing the basic proportions, okay? Then a little bit later, some of the other gestures 
come out. But again, this is only going to come, and I wanted to show you because this is an advanced level of it. This is the level that you hit, okay, when you spend countless hours and summers filling up your sketchbook. Countless time. Okay, in order to get to that next level, once you get to this level and you, you master proportion, you understand shape and silhouette, the next thing that comes right after that is this. It's understanding full gesture and making your drawings come alive. Okay, all right, next, and part of that, observation and acting. Okay, I was looking for this demo that I wanted to play for you, and it was, I think I've talked about it before. It was one of the the Woody, one of the key animators on Woody. In this animator, in order to animate Woody, this is what he would do. He was in his cubicle at Pixar, and he would come out of his cubicle and he would go like this. He'd be like, and he'd be talking with his fellow animators, and he'd be like, hey, wait a minute, I said, get over here, come back. And he's throwing his arms around, he's bending his legs, and he's, he's becoming Woody, okay? There's something important there. When I draw at home, I have a mirror next to my desk, okay? If I'm drawing an elephant that's heavy and overweight, I have to do the elephant. I have to act it out, okay? When I was a student here, okay, Marshall Vandriff told me to go take a class with a gentleman named Don Richardson at UCLA Extension, okay? The reason why he wanted me to take that class is Don Richardson is one of the original theatrical actors that taught acting. He was like 80-something years old when I took the class with him. And I went there to learn about human form and acting. Because, and I, at first I was like, Marshall, are you crazy? Why do you want me to just go, go take his class? He kept telling me. So I did. And what I learned was I'm not an actor. I'm not blessed that way, okay? But watching actors at home, I walk around and I do my characters on drawing. Why? If I can act like them and if I can talk like them, they're going to come out on the paper. That is a given. So when it comes to acting and observation, it's not just observing somebody, but when, you're, when you get to a higher level and you're designing a character, you have to feel them. For example, okay, I, I'm gonna, I'll just do this here on the desk. I can't get jump up on the desk and do it, but I had to draw once I was on a production and I was doing some storyboard revision work, and I had to, there was a group of kids that were backpacking and they encountered silverback gorillas. So we had to draw them in our storyboard. What is the pose of a silverback gorilla? That's the pose. All their weight, everything on their fists, like this, and just their head turns and their body doesn't even move. It took us like two weeks to figure that out and to draw it correctly in the board so the animators could then animate the sequence correctly. Okay, so if I'm going to anim if I'm going to draw and design a character that needs to have, you know, let's say somebody's really happy and they're going and have a little bit of a step. Have you ever felt like that? Where you're rock walking sort of upbeat and you have a little bit of a skip in your step? There's actually an expression based off that, right? What about when somebody walks in and their head's down? And they're like, no. And you can tell. First thing you see, if you see a friend like that, you go, what's wrong? Three days ago, my wife walked in downstairs. She's like, this. Mom, what's wrong? She's like, nothing's wrong. And I'm like, okay. Why is your head down? Because she has an abscess that came back to where her, one of her root canals was. And now she had to go, and she's actually getting a root canal right now. She had to go back in today, but she had to wait three days in pain before getting the root canal done. Because she had one done before, and something happened, and she got an infection. She has an abscess. The gesture she displays is this. Her head's down. She's totally sulking, okay? So if you want to become really good at understanding part of drawing and draftsmanship, and especially getting to a point in terms of character design where you're employable, you have to be able to act out. You have to be able to understand part of the basics of who the character is that you're getting involved with. Now, I'm taking this to a design level. If you're there at Disney and you see some lady who's walking around, and she's like, imagine this. She's got like three kids on one arm. She's got lunches in this other arm. She's holding like her own Starbucks drink, and she's trying to make her way to the tables to sit down to eat. That would be a great gesture to obtain. But when you're watching that, you have to try to place yourself in that individual. You have to try to feel that weight 
of three kids tugging on one arm. See what I just did? That's the feeling where you jerk to one side because kids are like 40, 50 pounds and then pulling on your arm, you have to apply force to pull them to one side, right? That has to come through part of your drawing. And when people do that correctly, this is what part of the final outcome is. When you can act part of that part, you're able to draw part of that part. You have to see, the, this is why animators have a mirror in front of their face. This is why character designers that are really good at what they do have a mirror in front of their face, okay? Because they can look at that mirror, they can interpret, and then they can basically, this brings us to part of our next section that's coming up here, okay? Is that they have the ability to look, act, and they have the ability to embellish on top of what it is they are seeing, okay? So understanding acting and understanding what part of these poses are, okay, and what part of the gestures are and the movements that are involved with basic day-to-day -day communication are what are going to make you a stronger designer. That all goes into this, okay? You cannot draw somebody who is surprised if you have not done this with your hands. I'm sorry, but it's the, sad, it's the truth, okay? You have to walk around your room and do that. How do you do forgiveness? How do you do appeal? How do you draw apology? I could talk about my dad. I can draw anger any day of the week, right? Because he's 84 and he's always pissed off at something. You want to see what Mediterranean anger is? Mediterranean anger is this. Right there. It's all the power wrapped up in my little fist with three fingers touching each other. And this is Mediterranean anger. That right there. Mediterranean people talk with their hands. So when my dad's pissed, he puts his three fingers together, his thumb, his index, and his middle finger, and he's, you know, he's already leaned over a little bit, and he walks into like his bank and he goes, the lady goes, Can I help you? And he goes, Well, yes, you can. You send me a form here, I don't know what it means. And then while he's doing that, he's pointing at her and he's moving his fingers and doing this. Okay? Isn't that a beautiful? I look at that and I almost want to take a picture of my dad. I'm totally embarrassed, but then I'm like, why oh, you gotta yell at everybody? I always tell him, right? But I'm like, but he's doing something with his hand that I catch, you know. The other thing he does is anytime we're sitting at the table and reading and somebody doesn't like, he goes like this. That right there. So I go, oh yeah. I was telling him, hey dad, you know, um, taking my son Alexander, we're gonna go camping, we're gonna go motorcycle riding, and I told him I bought a new dirt bike. And he goes. First thing he does, throws his arms up in the air and he spins his head from one side to the other. When I went over there after Trump won the election, he's all throwing his head up in the air, all upset, all angry, right? That's the gesture that comes out, right? So the importance of seeing that, being able to act it, right? Being able to convey it, knowing the curve of the spine, seeing when it happens, okay? Pivotal, extremely pivotal, okay? This, the next step then after that gesture, this is where we learn to embellish. You guys know what that word means? It's basically us cheating and adding something onto it, okay? It's us looking at the features of a particular individual and adding more features on top of that. It, it is, the, the other term for embellishment is overacting, okay? I hate it when I'm out drawing at a coffee house. Someone comes by and looks at my sketchbook and the lady goes, I don't look like that. And I'm like, well, lady, in my world, you do. Okay? That's what I always say. Like, I take somebody that might have a little bit of a saggy boob, and I give them very saggy boob. Or I take somebody that's a little overweight and make them very overweight. I take somebody that has a little bit of a nose, and I give them a big nose. I take somebody that has big eyes, and I make them even bigger. Okay? Does that make sense? That's embellishment. It's adding on to the drawing because it establishes and creates character. Right? Character is important. If you can't learn how to embellish on your work, okay, and add to particular poses and expressions, you're going to miss out right there. Okay? One of my favorite drawings right here. Jack Davis. Okay? Um, wait. Did I say that right? It was... Hanna Barbera, no wait, it was Joe Barbera that did this. I'm not saying Jack Davis, I'm thinking of somebody else. Joe Barbera, huh? Is that No, this is from uh, early MGM days 
when you had, so Hannah Barbera was actually, um, you had Joe Barbera and, and Bill Hanna. There were two artists who were working MGM. They were animating. Uh, they were working together, and they started on Tom and Jerry. They left there to create their own series. They're really great draftsmen, and and some of their drawings just sort of changed everything. I don't think this is in that book. It might be, but anyway, point being is that when you get to this level of embellishment, this is what separates you from the crowd, okay? If you get, remember, I told you everyone in here can get to the, the level of proportions. To get to that next arc, right, what do you have to do? To get to that next level, to go over proportions, you have to draw all the freaking time. You have to love to draw. You have to love your craft. And if you spend, this is just like my buddy, like Joe Spatterford said, if I would have spent another year drawing in my sketchbook every day and drawing the human form and learning more about anatomy, I would have been, I could have been that director. I could have gone into story and perhaps gone to Pixar. Does that make sense? Okay. It's literally down to that little level. Some of you will only draw the human form up to proportion size and then you will leave it alone. Okay. How old am I? Well, you guys don't know. I like it when someone says 35. Okay. Did I pose those creatures in my sketchbook when I drew them? No. Because I don't have creatures to pose. Okay. When I draw people that are standing or little girls with monsters and boys and their robots, that's all coming out of my head. This is practice. I'm, I'm a, so ecstatic because I have two pages left in this book and I'm done and I get to go to a new sketchbook which part of my goal was is I want to finish my new sketchbook half of it by the end of the summer okay that's my goal all right I'm getting better and better at what I do because I'm constantly sketching I'm constantly drawing and yet I still continue to get phone calls I get phone calls to do storyboard work. I get phone calls to do revision work. I'm constantly busy as an artist. Now I'm saying no a lot. Well, I work as a teacher too, but when I get my freelance work, there's certain work that I like, which is cool for me to be able to say no. These are the individuals that go to that higher level, okay? It's getting that level of drawing so much that you're now expressing acting, okay? You have personality. You have embellishment of the human figure. You're taking things to that complete higher level, okay? This leads us to the next phase. These next two phases are what make you become a master. Can you full pose a figure of an individual? Full pose, everything. Can you draw a character, full pose them, and give them life, give them feeling, give them a sense of personality? And then can you go back and can you add in color to make it look fantastic, okay? That's difficult in itself because when adding color and doing line, a lot of artists flatten their drawings. Right, Kevin? Right? You kill the drawing underneath. So that right there in itself is something else that takes more time. The thing is that all of this is ob obtainable by you guys. Okay? Look at the master here. Look at Carter Goodrich. Okay? Here's a guy who does character design for a huge amount of movies. Okay, a lot of Pixar movies, a lot of uh, other movies done over Blue Sky. Beautiful designer. And one of his secrets to his drawing, I'm looking at it and I can tell, is that he doesn't retain hard edges. He gets very soft flowing edges and he has a way of coming in and putting in all that texture. Does that sound familiar? We talked about texture in this class, right? We talked about patterns. Look at the patterns on this character. Circle patterns linear patterns, vertical linear patterns, crossed patterns along that metal, okay? Striped patterns, other striped patterns. There's like, look at the beard. There's five or seven different patterns in there, okay? That's huge. That's the way that this guy worked. That's what separates him out as a master, okay? Look at these drawings, they're beautiful. And on top of it, on top of all this sketching and everything, the thing that drives me most nuts when I talk to a student and they're like, I don't know if I can succeed. I don't know if I can get any good or do any better. And I'm like, dude, you guys have Pinterest available to you. You can just go on to Pinterest and type in Carter Goodrich 
and create a whole subfolder and fill it with all his work. Then Pinterest allows you to piggyback off of other people's works and bring it all together. Are you kidding me? That's freaking insane. We had nothing like that in 95 when I was a student. We were like looking in 94, we we're like looking at, at National Geographic and having to run out and take pictures of things. Okay? So then after full posing, okay, the next step is full expression and gesture. We call these model sheets. When you can draw a model sheet of a character in multiple facial expressions and multiple body poses, you are now at this level. You are at the highest level possible. At that level, that highest level, you can do whatever the hell you want. What do you want to do? You want to write children's books? You want to create your own line and be an entrepreneur and sell them? Like Theodore Geisel? You know who Theodore Geisel is? Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Okay, you want to be a millionaire? Go do it. What's stopping you? You want to end up like Mike Naraki and Phil Vischer? Owners and creators of VeggieTales? $96 million in five years on VHS sales alone. Number one selling property inside the United States for kids. Go do it. Nothing's stopping you. When you get to this upper level, you could do whatever the hell you want. Do you want to work in animation? Go work in animation. You want to do storyboards? Go to storyboards. If you can draw like this, the sky is the limit. The only thing standing between you and here is a number of sketchbooks. That's it. And Robert's sleeping in the middle of class. But that's all right. So the only thing that stands between you getting to this level are these right here. I like to hit it with my knuckles. Sketchbooks. If you could produce 10 of these in the next two years, I guarantee you, you'll be closer and closer to this. This is Nico Marley, by the way. This is a master right here. This is an individual who has the ability not only to design and create a character, but then he could pose the character in multiple views and show you multiple personalities. And it makes you look at it and it gives you like a warm feeling inside, doesn't it? It makes you feel happy. And when I look at this, it makes me want to go home and draw. All right. Actually, that one wasn't Nico. I'm not sure on that one. I think this is somebody that copied Nico and his style, but did a dinosaur. But this is Nico. Nico has a very certain style. This is Nico as well up here. Okay. He works in a traditional style with some really cool like colored pencils and it's very soft and he has a really great way of developing things, right? Outside of this, okay, look at that. Look at how beautiful that is. That's for Disney, for Disney features, right? Look at the character in there. Look at the posing. 10 sketchbooks and you're getting closer to becoming that, okay? Man, that's beautiful stuff. I don't know about you, but that's what I look at that. That's what I aspire to be. When I'm 65, I still want to be able to go to work with a freaking cane. I want to be able to drive down to Disney and go work for some of my friends that are directing something and they because they asked me to storyboard out a sequence because I know my shit. Excuse my French. <laughs> but because I do, because I know my stuff. When I get called now to still work on things, someone said to me once, is it true you get phased out in the industry because you get older? Well, it's there's a little bit of truth to that, but it's also age and it's about your talent. Some people in life choose to stop growing. They choose to settle off and die. I'm 46, actually I'm 47, I'm 47 now. I still ride dirt bikes and ride skateboards, even though when I get hurt, my recovery time's a little bit longer, but I still do these things. You know what most of the guys of my age do now? I still go body surfing. I still go hiking. I still go out and go snow hiking. I do all these things I love to do. You know what most of my friends do? They do nothing. They sit around, they consume, they've made decisions to become consumers. They sit around, they consume fast food, they get overweight, they get heavy, they develop diabetes, they develop other related problems, and basically your mid-40s becomes what I call the early grave marker. A lot of doctors call it that as well. The early grave marker to not make it into your 60s. So. I didn't make that choice, right? People have those choices ahead of them, okay? As you continue forward, look at this. Here's another set of masters, right? You guys are in like your 20s. Some of you in here, no names, Jacqueline, all right? 17, 
I mean, you have your whole life ahead of you and you're already talented and you can draw. Imagine if you spent the next two or three years here taking classes, developing your sketchbook. By 21, you would be a monster of talent. You would be able to go out there. Heck, you could still get a degree and graduate and be out work. By 24, you would have a bachelor's degree and you would be able to pretty much pick and choose where you want to work. And it all comes down to this. Sketchbook. What are you going to do to get there? Okay. Don't lock yourself up. Don't give up. Don't stop drawing. Okay. By the way, this is Creature Box, right? That's a traditional drawing right there with markers. Awesome. Master your craft. Master your skills. Look at that. Their silhouettes and their character designs and their technique. Everything comes together. Absolutely beautiful, right? Fantastic work. Okay. You can't go wrong with that stuff. Okay. So, the question I get from students, how do I get better? Whose work do I look at? Sometimes it's, there is that, and we're going to talk about that right now. I'm going to give you a sample of four different artists here that I feel are great artists to look at. If you want to become better at drawing the human form. So I've laid it out. This is basic drawing for entertainment arts. Here we are, last three to four weeks left in school. I have to introduce the human figure to you and talk about its importance. What's the importance of the human form? If you master the human form, you pretty much can do whatever you want. That's the truth. Because if you can master the human form in anatomy and understand osteology, bone structure, and then you get into lighting and rendering and you know how to draw and represent it, what else do you want to do? Do you want a storyboard? People will hire you to storyboard. Learn to tell stories. That's easy. You know? You want to go work and do character design? Do character design. You want to become a toy designer? You want to be a product designer? If you can draw the human figure and it's complex, then you can draw whatever you want. It never changes from that standpoint. Never at all. Okay? That's a really important thing to think about here. Here are four different artists that can help get you there. Okay? This is George Bridgman. Okay? You can pick up some of his books. Some of you can get some of his stuff on PDF. It's out there. He's older. He's gone. He used to teach at Art Center a little bit, a couple other places. He's passed. The thing about George Bridgman that's really great is he had a way of looking at the human figure and showing it in chunks and planes, right? He's able to show muscles and anatomy and give you a, a, an idea of how these proportions felt as embellished and exaggerated blocky chunks, okay? When I was a student here with Marshall Vandriff, we drew from Bridgman all the time. We had a dedicated class for this on human anatomy where we would just sit and draw Bridgman poses. He has books on heads and hands. He has books on the figure, on posing, everything. Right? And they're thin paper books. They're not too expensive. Most of those are all online because they've been out for a while. They're like six to eight bucks. Go get a book. Copy Bridgman. Everything in there is beautiful. Look at this. He's taking a skull. Look at that. He's doing a planimetric head. He's transferring that into simplicity. That right there is the next step after your mannequin is going into that right there. Okay? That's how it works. All right? Look at that posing right there. Talking about balance, this is cool. This is something I learned back in the day. He's talking about center of weight. The human body works like this. If there's a line down the middle like a skewer, I learned this when I was in wrestling because I learned to beat my opponent. If I push them off of that line, they were, su they were more susceptible to being knocked off balance and being taken down. So you had to push your opponent, spin in a circle, and get them to get off center that line. So if somebody's moving, we always have to have this line because it's the way that gravity holds our figure together. So our body, if we go too much this way, we go back this way, right? Um, if you're standing on the edge of something about to fall, you go like this with your arms and you throw your arms forward because you're adjusting for the weight that allows your body to come forward a little bit more, okay? When I ride my dirt bike, my head and my shoulders are my weight control. So if I duck down low, my weight compresses to hit things. If I hit something and I push up, the bike pushes up with me. If I pull the handlebars up, it raises. If I push it down. The other thing is when I'm standing, I if I just stand on the pegs and I'm not touching the bike, I can shift the bike left or right and have an immediate change very quickly. That's how riders tend, that's how jockeys work. Very similar to people that ride outdoor like enduro and dirt bikes. I think it's the same mentality. It's using your weight and center of gravity and this, this line that gets thrown down the middle to, to construct and generate, you know, figure in motion. Okay, next, Steve Houston. 
Look at this guy. This guy's local, by the way. You used to be able to go take a class from him down at the local 839 Animation Union figure drawing. But Carl Ganas was there, too. He has a book out. It's a great book. Talks about the figure. Talks about the motion. Talks about gesture, lines of action, right? And the one thing that Steve's really good at doing is translating the human figure to a finished pose. It's beautiful, okay? I found this book, which I'd never seen before. This is amazing. I want to get this book so I can go home and draw. I'm going to get this book. I don't have it. Someone else had it upstairs, and I was already taking pictures of it, right? This book shows the human figure with flayed with all the skin off. It shows you all the muscles. So now I can go draw big badass monsters and know exactly where their anatomy is, looking at their skeletal structures, looking at their rib cages, everything. It's a beautiful book. The next book, Michael Hampton. Okay, another great book. I was mentioning before about artists creating books, learning their craft, selling their books, making multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Our a famed Joe Weatherly that's here. Michael Hampton, another local artist to California. He sold this book. I can't, I couldn't even guess how much money he's made off this book. Okay, everything, look at the cover, look at the gesture drawing. Everything to gesture drawing, to construction. Look at the mannequin construction right there. Construction and light, understanding the form, understanding gesture drawing, right? Pulling that all together, another super duper fantastic book. Okay, so there right there are four basic books that you could get, you could add on to your collection. So just to go over them again, one of them is Michael Hampton right there. Let me just go back up a little bit more. The other one is Stuart Elliott. Okay, great book. I looked in that book and I couldn't put it down. Another one was Steve Houston, another great book. And another one was George Bridger. Okay, that's going to guide you there to that higher level after. Okay, but you know, this is it. That's, I just gave you guys 76 slides on the human form. And hopefully you look at that and it helps you inspire a little bit about yourselves and what you want to do. The thing that I love about putting lectures like this together, it allows you to see the steps and progression of drawing proportions, silhouettes, shape, gesture, okay, getting up to embellishment, getting up to acting, getting up to full poses, getting up to doing, you know, model sheets. That's what makes you really good at your craft, okay? All right, thanks, guys. Keep drawing.